This episode is sponsored by Audible. Scientists may one day figure out how to duplicate a person, body, and mind. No doubt the scientist who perfects the process will be beside himself with joy after he successfully tests it. A staple of science fiction is the notion of copying or cloning living things. Today we'll take a look at what such technologies might actually produce in terms of new opportunities and challenges for humanity and for individuals, and indeed for the very concept of individuality. We might as well start by saying that cloning gets used both to refer to outright duplication of a person, either as a full grown copy, or one with the same mind and memories too, as well as in the sense of simply growing a new organism from the DNA of the original. The word itself, clone, is Greek for twig, as in a small branch, and of course you can often take a twig, plant it, and make a new tree from it, as opposed to a pollinated seed. This is a new tree but of identical and singular origin, it hasn't got two parents. We fairly recently learned how to do this with animals, including humans, and it's what most often is being referred to as cloning. We'll keep with that for today and save duplicate for meaning an identical copy of a person, as opposed to simply a copy of the mind, like mind uploading, or some intentionally hybrid form. Cloning, which was still sci-fi when I was a kid, is now commercially available for cloning dead pets. We obviously could clone humans too, but it's quite the ethical sticking point for a variety of reasons. One of which is that there's always a question as to what role you'd have with a clone, and it really has no black and white answer. That person is your identical twin, only much younger than you, and we could regard them as a child or a sibling, and both parental and fraternal roles have long been viewed as transferable to folks you're not related to, not simply step-siblings or children, but someone you regard as like a brother or sister, or who you mentor or are mentored by. Now overall, this type of cloning, simply making an infant copy of an organism, doesn't have many advantages when we're talking about something that has a sophisticated brain, as personality is strongly influenced by environment. Cloning a tree that you see as very healthy makes sense, though it exposes you to the downsides of a lack of diversity. A field full of genetically identical plants is more vulnerable to disease for instance, which we see with things like the Irish Potato Famine of the 19th century. And ethical issues aside, cloning animals for lab testing is scientifically important, because if you want your medical research experiments to be repeatable, you need to use identical standardized rats. It's potentially handy for animals where their acquired behavior is mostly irrelevant too, like livestock, where you clone your best specimens if you can do it cheaper than producing them naturally or if it adds a value equal to or exceeding the increased cost. Of course in a society that can do that, one can also probably just grow meat, as we looked at in synthetic meat. But cloning seems limited in its use, in terms of humans, as we'd be unlikely to want to clone complete people for many reasons, as opposed to just cloning human organs for transplant. There are not a lot of uses for human cloning that are either beneficial or ethical, and few uses that are both so its impact on our culture is likely to be limited to fiction, or if not, the black market. You clone Einstein and that kid is probably going to be smart, but he won't be Einstein and might go nuts being expected to live up to that. Someone might clone Hitler, either hoping to get revenge or to try to redeem him through a better upbringing, but both are rather contemptible goals. You could clone a lost loved one, but it's not them, and morally speaking, it's probably not kind to them. Few folks like getting compared to a parent or older sibling with expectation of matching their deeds, and think how much worse it would be on the clone, particularly as it's likely to be an act derived from a special attitude toward that original. Someone might do that for a child they lost, or who similarly had gone down a bad road and they wanted to have a do-over. You might clone a spouse who died or left you, but raising your clone spouse is rather horrifying, we see that in the 2011 film Womb, and even if the intent was to have a child you didn't have a chance to have together, you could just as easily create one who mixed both your genes together. You don't actually need someone's sperm or egg cells, just their DNA, and we leave that everywhere. Cloning also raises weird legal issues about who owns DNA, already a growing issue in biotechnology research. 
Because someone who doesn't like their genes can presumably get someone else's. I would imagine there will be quite a market for that in the future, and of course that market already exists via sperm banks and egg donors, but could someone who had such a sample, legally acquired, ethically clone that person rather than using half their genes to make a new person? Imagine someone was thinking of having kids or adopting, but met a child they thought was particularly adorable and clever and picked up a sample of their DNA and went and got themselves a cloned version. My gut says that probably ought to be illegal, and I suspect most would agree, but I'm not really sure what the crime would be or its severity, and that could be a knee-jerk reaction. After all, you are not your DNA, any more than a house is the tree or clay pit its lumber or bricks were made from. They certainly matter, but in terms of nature versus nurture, regardless of which is the biggest factor, nurture is a major factor and your clone raised by different folks and in different times and places is just not going to be you in any meaningful sense. So it's hard to argue you've had something stolen from you, and though I think many of us would feel that was the case, folks in the future might feel otherwise. Particularly as we're not likely to give clones special legal rights of inheritance. I mean if I clone a famous musician, I don't see how they'd have any rights toward that person's compositions or the royalties of them for all that they share far more of their DNA than that musician's own children, who would normally inherit those properties. Things get trickier when we start talking about duplication though, since they are presumably getting your memories. Duplication here is a pretty vague term as well. It is arguably more like copying an identity, itself a rather vague term. This does not necessarily mean I'm cloning you but as an adult and down to your brain cells, If I copy your brain into an android and stick it next to a normal clone of you, which one has a more legitimate claim to being you? Not something to answer too quickly either. We don't want to just say possession of someone's memories confers identity, because we might be able to give someone multiple people's memories. We went over those in some detail in our Consciousness and Identity episode, but let's consider it from a cloning and duplication perspective with a hypothetical example. Let's say two men, Alex and Zach, are in the hospital together, and both are diagnosed with some awful terminal illness. They chat and Zach says he's getting frozen at his friend's cryogenics farm. Alex is wealthy and has no next of kin he wishes to leave it to, so he puts his money into a trust held by his parents and goes on ice with Zach. A few years later, Alex's parents miss him, and no real progress has been made toward curing his disease or even toward reviving frozen people, so they get him cloned and name the clone Brandon. But unbeknownst to anyone, Alex's ex-girlfriend stole a sample of Alex's DNA and had it combined with her own so that she could have his child, who she named Charlie. A few years later, still no progress has been made toward reviving frozen people but the technology has advanced to scan frozen brains, 3D print exact copies with memories intact, and implant those into cyborg bodies. And so the cryogenics form allows a brain printing company to transplant a copy of Alex's brain into a shiny cyborg who they named Dwayne. But the brain printing company's Terms and Conditions page, which most people click on without reading, allows them to sell customer brain scans to a company researching mind uploading. They create and boot up a digital copy of Alex's mind on a supercomputer. The copy is convinced it's Alex, but they name it Eric. Not long later, they download a copy of Eric into an android body and name it Frank. Meanwhile, the brain printing company has figured out how to print actual bodies with scanned brains, so now they print a complete copy of Frozen Alex. But the copy is imperfect and missing a few of Alex's memories but they do coordinate with other companies on their alphabetical naming so they name the imperfect copy George. And finally, the cryo company figures out how to unfreeze people and they unfreeze Alex, but they hadn't quite perfected their technique either, and Alex has a massive aneurysm from the process. This shouldn't have been a major problem since they have his brain scans to use in doing repairs, but they have another snafu and accidentally grab Zack's brain template instead. So now, Alex is missing some of his memories and has a fair number of Zack's memories and personality quirks. It's a dangerous procedure that the doctors only attempted because Alex had been a vegetable, so they flat out refused to try to repair Alex again, since he seems sane and whole. 
but to study the possible effects of similar mind mergings, they simulate combining Alex and Zach's brains on the computer. So now there's Hal, an uploaded mind with both Alex and Zach's complete memories. So now we've got Alex, who has some of Zach's memories and is missing some of his, we've got his clone Brandon, we've got his son Charlie, we've got Dwayne, who has that printed brain copy in a cyborg Frankenstein body, we've got uploaded Eric, we've got Eric's copy into an android, Frank, we've got the printed brain organic duplicate George, and finally we've got Hal, who is now of two minds on this whole freezing process. Alex is really still Alex, just with some brain trauma really, and he and George arguably have a claim on Zack's estate. Brandon inherited the estate from his parents entirely legally as their clone. Charlie is Alex's son, just via a sperm bank and without his permission. Dwayne was the first actual copy on the scene, with a full memory even though he's a cyborg. Eric also has a full copy of that brain, just no body, as does Frank, who has an android body. George also has Zack's memories in a complete cloned body, but is missing some and of course Hal is the same as Eric but has Zack's too. I have no idea how this case would be decided in the court, or what would actually be fair as justice and fairness are not always equivalent concepts. If there's any probate lawyers or judges in the audience, I'd be curious how you think that would get ruled on, though my own guess would be that Brandon would keep the estate and of course it would presumably depend on where it was all done, since there are a lot of different traditions on inheritance rights. There's a temptation to divide it evenly, but that's neither just nor fair, and would only add to the problem since for instance if Eric thought that was going to happen, he might simply make another digital copy of himself for an equal share, or a dozen, maybe even just to spite the others. So too, if Charlie, Alex's semi-natural son, gets a cut, wouldn't any child of George the Organic Duplicate be entitled to the same, and for that matter, if George underwent the same procedure Alex had after his aneurysm, but with the proper brain scan being used instead of Zack's, would he now be more Alex than Alex currently is? And if yet another duplicate is made later, can that duplicate challenge the ruling? For that matter, none of this happens simultaneously, so who came first probably matters especially since otherwise we have to worry about future duplicates getting a share if we discard chronology or birth order. Should the amount of memory actually matter, or alternatively, should the amount of other memories from other people matter? Dwayne might be considered the oldest mind copy since he was around longest, and accumulated the most life experience since, though that might be arguable too since Eric is an uploaded mind and might experience a subjectively sped up existence, running at hundreds of times the speed of a normal human brain and experiencing a year for every day that passes in the normal world. Now you might be thinking, with all this confusion, maybe it would be better if we just didn't look into such technology, but the stuff has its uses, both to the individual and the society. Also, the inheritance thing might not be a terribly big deal in a high-tech civilization that might be post-scarcity and not terribly interested in money where survival and comfort are concerned. Let's consider a few less confusing scenarios. A person might get themselves duplicated because they were a brilliant and passionate scientist who was working on cancer, and two heads are better than one and a hundred better yet, and we might approve of that. A person might use this to extend their own lifetime, though while that notion is popular in science fiction, I'd imagine we could repair an existing body offering life extension with essentially the same technology. The scientist case is an interesting one though since the fellow was doing it to advance a cause they were very passionate about, and that seems kind of okay, maybe even laudable. Someone really passionate about a political cause though might use it to mass duplicate themselves so they could get extra votes in an election, or extra soldiers in a war. Indeed if they're passionate enough about this cause, they might go really overboard and make tons of copies, even being willing to commit suicide with all but one after the election or conflict to avoid burdening society. One would have to at least respect their commitment to their cause. But it has more benign use too, 
Most of us do not feel we have any obligation to justify wanting a child to anyone else, and I suspect that would translate to a duplicate of yourself too. A person offered two very desirable but exclusive life paths might copy themselves to enjoy both, which seems fine and as we discussed for space colonization, might be a very good way to get a big pool of skilled colonists for many different star systems if lots of folks were reluctant to leave their homes for century-long journeys. I could load a thousand people on a colony ship from a pool of a couple thousand volunteers, and just keep loading more and more ships with a thousand copies, each randomly selected from those volunteers, different permutations, and by the time those folks arrived at their new world, those unique combinations of duplicates would have resulted in major changes to each of those folks from all the different friendships and duties formed, and unique daily experiences, in each unique crew roster, long before they landed on an alien world that will further divorce them from those other duplicates. Alternatively, if a football player was offered the chance to join two teams and couldn't decide which, he might copy himself so he could be on both. On the legal side, either team might object to honoring the original contract, arguing that they weren't getting as good a deal now that there were two of them. Many would also object that it was robbing another player of a chance at their dream. A society might have serious problems if the cream of the crop graduating from college were deciding they wanted to take up several appealing offers and opted for lots of duplication so they could do each as those positions are now denied from the folks who would have been the runner-up. Also, one might engage in quasi-polygamy by duplicating yourself to marry two different people. Not really sure how this fits into ethics but I suspect a lot of folks would object. One might imagine someone considering a divorce because they were having an affair deciding to duplicate themselves so they could marry that other person while sticking with their current spouse and children for time. That might make for some bizarre divorce court filings and custody battles, especially if the duplicate who remarried wanted partial custody of their kids. The future is never something we should speak of with much certainty about, though I feel confident saying that legal scholars will get a lot of headaches, and psychologists a lot of new problems to study and a lot of new customers. But lastly, I mentioned duplication of identity near the beginning because of course, folks change with time, especially with very different environments. That's why it's handy for colonizing other solar systems if you're short on volunteers. Within a generation, there's very little similarity in those colonies even if they had identical rosters of colonists. However, in general, a lot of folks would want to duplicate themselves to enjoy multiple experiences and still share them. This offers some major technical challenges even if you could share memories. Our brains aren't wired up with digital time index memory recordings, so trying to match those experiences together might be very hard. We see some examples of that in Alastair Reynolds' novel House of Suns, which follows a group of a thousand clones who explore the galaxy separately and meet up every several thousand years to swap experiences. I suspect that might result in some sort of multi-person narrative chapter experience, where you got fed the experiences of your copies while you slept or similar, so you felt like you were teleporting between lives each day. Such folks might form communal hive minds in reverse, one mind in several bodies rather than some overmind of collective consciousness, but they might instead view it like commuting between lives getting fed those other experiences like episodes of several TV shows, which I also suspect would result in a lot of headaches for legal scholars if one of those duplicates commits a crime, trying to decide if they should charge them all, and also a lot of new business for psychologists. As is so often the case with the future, about the only guarantee is that it ought to be an exciting and weird experience, though in this case, It's shuffling around who all those experiences happen to that is the weirdest part. So some folks might be wondering why there's an extra episode out today, and in fact two of them since we got that bonus episode on if technology could develop without fire just released on Nebula too. I thought it would make an amusing trick or treat and cloning seems an appropriate topic for a day with multiple videos out. It's a popular topic in science fiction too, And probably my favorite book series featuring that is the Bob Trilogy by my friend Dennis E. Taylor, 
beginning with a novel, We All Legion, We All Bob, which introduces us to a character who rapidly becomes additional characters. Cloning is always a tricky topic, as is space colonization, and Taylor handles both topics superbly, with amazing realism and a superb sense of genre humor that makes the trilogy a favorite for those of us who are longtime science fiction fans and are already familiar with the concepts. You can get a free copy of We Are Legion, We Are Bob, or the other books in the trilogy at audible.com slash Isaac, or text Isaac to 500 Audible offers a 30-day free trial, but each month you're a member, you now get a free audiobook and two Audible Originals, and those credits roll over to the next month or year and stay yours, along with any books you got, even if you later discontinue your membership. And with their convenient app, you can listen on any of your devices and seamlessly pick up where you left off, whether you're listening at home, commuting, running errands, or off jogging at the gym. Audible makes it cheap and easy to access a vast collection of amazing stories on any device. That will close us out for October, and we'll be back next Thursday for a look at Cybersecurity. Until then, thanks for watching and have a happy Halloween!